Thanks, Mike. And uh, stay there, friends, in chapter 36, our final week in this uh, part of the book of Genesis. Uh, my rough poll last week of those who would like to finish Genesis next year. I had a 100% strike rate, strike rate of people who want to finish it next year. And so we're coming back. Uh, we'll come back uh, the last Sunday of February. We'll start working through the uh, last 13 chapters of Genesis, which I'm excited about. Hope you are. Stay with us and I'll see you back here in February. Um, all right. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you that you're a God who speaks and that you've sp spoken to us clearly by your word and in your Son. And we ask that you would continue to speak to us now as we look at this part of your word together and that you'd help us to take benefit from it uh, as your people listening to your word. And we ask it for the sake of Jesus and in the name of him. Amen. Your thoughts of God are too human. Your thoughts of God are too human. They were the words of Martin Luther to his opponent Erasmus uh, in reference to the lengths and depths God would go to in the mess and muck of this world to sovereignly bring people back to himself. Your thoughts of God are too human. God isn't absent from the mess and the muck. It's not beneath him, is saying Luther to Erasmus. God works in the mess and the muck. He's very present and very powerful even through it. Today is Reformation Sunday, uh, the Sunday before All Saints Day. It's a mark in our calendar to specifically remember what we constantly celebrate. Uh, the protest of our Protestant Reformation some 500 years ago was to come back to the simplicity of the good news about Jesus for people. Uh, the, that salvation from sin and death is not achieved through a complex religious system or complicated human philosophies, but rather it is all about freely receiving the gift of God's grace in Jesus as made clear in the Bible. It's all there is to it. So Luther says to Erasmus, your thoughts of God are too human, thinking God is beyond the reach of people and beyond the mess and the muck of this world. Uh, we've reached the end of Jacob's story in the book of Genesis. And just as back in chapter 25, we had the line of Ishmael at the end of Isaac's story, uh, so we have the line of Esau recorded here before we get to the story of Joseph and the remaining 13 chapters. And if the last 13 weeks have taught us anything, it is that God is not distant and he's not embarrassed and he's not disinterested when it comes to the mess and the muck of human lives. But actually, that's where his gracious work of saving people happens. That's where his promises of blessing and restoration get worked out. The genealogy of Esau, the firstborn of Isaac's twin sons, it doesn't trace the line of God's promise because God's sovereign choice, you remember, was for Jacob to carry that covenant responsibility. The older son, Esau, would serve the younger son, Jacob, and Jacob would be the one who has the blessing and the one through whom God's covenant promises would be fulfilled. But just because this isn't the line of promise doesn't mean that God is absent. And it doesn't mean that God is not at work. One reminder that we get from Esau's line as we read this detailed account that Mike has helpfully told us to do this afternoon in our own time one thing that we're reminded of as we read this account of all these nations and people and families and kings and chiefs and tribes that come through the line of Esau is a reminder that God's promises are for all nations. That God's promise to Abraham is that all nations will be blessed through him, 
God is seeking a people from every tribe and people and language and tongue. Verse 1 explicitly tells us that the people of God, that the family of Esau are one of those nations that God has people in, that God's word goes out to, even in warning and judgment. They are the troublesome neighbours of Israel, that is, they are the nation of Edom. Uh, One writer, Derek Kidner, has said this, he says, the brotherhood of Esau and Jacob living on the nations, live on in the nations of Edom and Israel. And that brotherhood is never forgotten in the Old Testament. And this chapter, chapter 36, uh, with its painstaking detail, is a witness to this sense of kinship, which will later come to service, to, to the surface in diplomacy, in law, in national feeling and in conflict. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, God says to his people Israel, he says, remember the Edomites, they are your brothers. God's call to Israel is to not despise their brothers, but to treat them as family, with brotherly affection, with warning, and with brotherly strife that will follow. So as we look at the family line of Esau today, and we're not going to do much of the detail, you may be relieved to know. Uh, What can we take from this list of names? What can we take from the lands and the rulers that we have in front of us? Well, I thought we'd do so through Luther's challenge that your thoughts of God are too human And I wonder if that was Esau's problem. And so here's three points. Your thoughts of God are too human. We want to look at human responsibility, human appetites and human successes. Starting with human responsibility, and that's a big one when you think about Esau, who's been fairly absent. We've seen him at at the, uh, the death of his father, reunited with his brother. We've seen him... Um, reconciled to Jacob in chapter 33. Uh, But when we think of human responsibility, we look all the way back to when we were reminded of God's sovereign choice that Jacob would carry his promises forward. And remember, Jacob deceptively grasps at the blessing of God and the birthright of the family of promise. Uh, He does so when when he buys the birthright from Esau for a bowl of lentil stew and when he tricks his father into giving him the family blessing. But even as we acknowledge the deceit of Jacob and that sin, through which God is even able to work and bring about his plans and purposes, chapter 25 reminded us and made clear for us that Esau missed out on his birthright because he despised it. Esau held too loosely to what it meant to belong to the family of God. Belonging to the family of promise and living in the long plan and the eternal purposes of God was not what Esau sought. He was the rugged man who enjoyed a hunt, enjoyed a good meal, who enjoyed the blessings of the land, but he couldn't see much beyond his own stomach. And that was confirming of God's decision of God's choice, that the promised line would, would go through, es- through Jacob, sorry. And that Esau was too concerned with his stomach, that Esau despised his birthright and gave up the grace of God, is what the, the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 12. This is what the writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 12 about Esau. The warning is that see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Esau couldn't look beyond his stomach. 
He was so caught up in the pursuits and the passions of his body that he held loosely to the family of God and that the things of God in this world were too light and too unimportant for him. And so Esau's, the first warning that we get from Esau is that of human responsibility, to not set aside the grace of God, to not hold so loosely to belonging to the family of God and to not hold so loosely to the things of God in this world because of the human appetites of our body and the allure of our land. So that's the second thing to look at, human appetites. Because it wasn't just the appetite of his stomach that drove him away. It wasn't just the appetite of his stomach in saying, if I don't eat, I'm going to die, as he said in chapter 25, give me that lentil stew. It was the, his appetites that drove him towards the women of Canaan. Like too many in our world, it was sex and relationships that drove Esau from the family of God as well. Verse 2, he took his wives from the women of Canaan. And if you start adding them up and start writing down names, you'll realise that he married multiple Canaanite wives in disobedience to God. And it was the pursuit of these foreign brides whose lives and whose practices, whose family, whose religion and traditions would further distance him from the family of promise would further confirm his direction away from the God of promise. And even when Esau seeks to fix his mistake, his disobedience in marrying the women of Canaan, even when he seeks to marry then someone from, the, from his own family, verse 3, he marries a daughter of Ishmael. Again, the son of Abraham, who, like, like him, was not the inheritor of God's covenant promises. Esau continues to hold loosely to the family of promise and make decisions that confirm his direction away from God's promises and not towards them. And for him, it was the immediate satisfaction of his human appetites. It was for the fleeting pleasures of this life that he gave up his birthright and his place in the family of promise. How often do we need to hear that warning? That the fleeting pleasures of this life are not worth the eternal forfeit of our souls. Food and sex and marriage and land and children, good things good gifts of God that are meant to be enjoyed, that are meant to be received with thanksgiving and enjoyed within God's good design and God's given boundaries of freedom and joy. Good things that are not meant to be ultimate things. And when we can't see beyond them to the giver and the creator that they're meant to point to, they make a shipwreck of our lives and a shipwreck of our faith. Paul says in Philippians, for as often as I told you before, I now tell you again, even with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Esau challenges us again to consider where our hope lies. That our hope does not lie in the, the fleeting pleasures of this life. To not make a God out of our stomach. To not make a God out of our families. To not make a God out of our jobs and our money. To not make a God out of the things of this world. To see our glory in simply the things of this life, but rather our citizenship is in heaven. Whenever I think about these things, there's two friends in particular who come to mind. And I share Paul's tears. As I think about these men who 
professed faith in Jesus, but who were too consumed with cars and with money and with relationships. And the appetites of their bodies led them away from the Lord Jesus. What good is it, Jesus said, to gain the whole world and to forfeit your soul? The story of Esau reminds us to check our hope, to check our appetites, to not forfeit or set aside the grace of God through human appetites or through human successes. Because that's what the line of Esau certainly highlights, that God kept his promise to Esau, that he would have land and he would have people and he would have powerful nations that would come from him. But it is not the line of promise. That is it when it comes to his inheritance. You've got the land, you've got the money, you've got the nations, you'll have nothing else. It's an impressive account in chapter 36 as you consider the land and the livestock, the nations, the chiefs and the kings that would come from his family. Deuteronomy later explains to us how Esau's family came to possess all the Horite land of the princesses that he married. And verse 31 tells us these were the kings who reigned in Edom before any Israelite king reigned. You look from the outside, there's no king in Israel. Their land wasn't secure. They existed in in poverty and famine, as we're going to see in the 13 chapters that are to come. That in their future is slavery in Egypt, wanderings in the desert. While here, Esau's family, they succeed. They're full of prosperity. They have kings and rulers, they have wealth and livestock. But what is it that these human successes meant for the people of Edom? Did it mean that they gave thanks to their creator God, who blessed them and kept his promises to their father Esau? Well, no, human success is power and wealth, size and strength. The rest of the Bible will talk about how Edom used power and strength and prosperity and size and stability. All those earthly blessings, all those human successes, Edom will use to oppose the purposes of God. To set themselves up against him and against his people. And so the book of Numbers tells us how Edom blocked Israel as they seek to flee Egypt. Malachi and Obadiah talk about Edom blocking Israel's escape as they're pursued by the Babylonians. Remember Edom? They thought they were so secure. Remember Obadiah? It's prophecy against the fall of Edom and their trust in their, uh, their, their, their fortified cliffs, which are still there today, if you ever go and see the city of Petra. Fortified cliffs of Edom. They thought they were too secure, too powerful, too successful for the God of the nations, the creator of heaven and earth. Human success for Edom meant taking their stand against God and his anointed, against God and his people. The trajectory of these Edomite kings taking their stand against God's purposes. We see it followed all the way through to that Edomite king, Herod the Great, who would seek to wipe out all the baby boys born at the time of Jesus. Human success for Edom meant taking their stand against God and his people. until we saw Esau's great son, Herod the Great, slaughter baby boys in seeking to end the life of Jesus in infancy. And we see Jesus, 
the great son of Jacob, born in poverty, born devoid of the prosperity, the security, the strength of this world. If you're looking for human success, Edom is a place to look. Israel is small, wandering, poor. But material blessing is not a sign of God's favour. Material blessing is not the, the, the ticket to show that you are on God's team and in God's family. And likewise, the lack of human success, the lack of material blessing is not a sign of God's displeasure. That Jesus, born in poverty, was not born outside the purposes and plan of God. He was not born outside the favour of God. Too often, our prayers and our desires and our thoughts of God are too human in thinking that we need the human successes, the material blessings, the things of this life that we cannot look beyond. And the things of God are too small in our minds and in our hearts and in our prayers. But in the midst of this picture of human success, of human appetites and human responsibility outside the covenant promises of God, I saw a little glimmer of hope this week. In that from the family of Eden the land of us would be populated, as the book of Lamentations tells us. And around this time, in the land of us, was a righteous man named Job, who reminds us that there are righteous people, those who have trusted in God and fear Him above all else, that God's plans and purposes are not narrowed by His sovereign and gracious choice of Jacob but because God's salvation because his gracious choice and his divine election is not based on merit and it's not based on strength it's not secured through family heritage it's not secured or grasped at by power or privilege God's saving power and his gracious election is the, is the wide lens of biblical history that reaches even into Edomite land like us where righteous Job would live and would die and would trust in the God of all faithfulness. This story the last 13 weeks has reminded us of God's particular promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob that through them the whole world would be blessed and that God, the God of all faithfulness, is not distant or disinterested or removed from the mess and the muck of human life. But that's where he works. That's where his grace reaches in and grabs people and saves them for all eternity. Even as we see in the manger in Bethlehem, when the incarnate Christ in the mess and the muck comes for our salvation. The story of Jacob reminds us that we take our place in the family of God by his grace, even here at the ends of the earth. That he is the God of all faithfulness and the God of the nations whose promises for life and hope for joy and peace, don't come through human successes. They aren't attained through human appetites, but they're gifted to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. His promises are for us and for all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call to himself. Paul says at the end of uh, Romans, in Romans 15, 
He says, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, might be confirmed and moreover that the nations might glorify God for his mercy. That's ultimately where we take our place in the story of Jacob. We're an inheritor of God's promises to Jacob in order that we might glorify God for his mercy, his grace given to us in Jesus because he is the God of all faithfulness. Why don't we pray together? Our Father, we thank you so much for our time in this part of your word over these past 13 weeks. Lord, we thank you that we are an inheritor of the promises you made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that through the Lord Jesus, we, here at the ends of the earth, might glorify you, our God and Father, for your infinite mercy and grace. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.